All right. So tonight on our 75th episode of the Barbarian Hour, we are going to have Clay Eagles in Oregon, Ohio, head coach, newly named head coach, Justin Wharton. Coach Wharton, how are we doing tonight? Doing great. Doing great, Zeb. Thanks for, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, okay, so I got a problem with you right out of the gate. Um, we're past 8 o'clock and you're still in your classroom. What? T t talk me through that. Walk me off the ledge with this, okay? Why are you still in your classroom past 8 o'clock? Yeah, well, uh, this fall I coached freshman football. And so tonight was fall sports awards, the fall sports banquet. And uh, that took place at 630. We wrapped up about eight. And um, yeah, and so came over here, just figured I wouldn't go home. Oh, 15, I live about 15 minutes uh, from the school, I think, in a, a neighborhood you're familiar with in Oregon. But so I just stayed here and uh, yeah, did, and, and did, the, did the talk with you here. Where do you live for uh, where, what neighborhood do you, are you from? Or do you, you know live off, in? You know, off Wheeling street behind the old, it used to be a farm like East Moreland neighborhood. Did you just say Willard street? Wheeling. Oh, Wheeling. Okay. Yeah. So you're like East Toledo. It, uh, Oregon. It's but, Oregon, but almost East Toledo, probably a couple almost, blocks away. Yeah. About two blocks away from East Toledo. Okay. Uh, how is that area? Is that where you grew up as well? That's where I grew up. That's where I grew up. Okay. So, and what did your parents do for a living? They went, uh, my mom worked at Toledo Hospital. My dad uh, worked at Keflon. At Teflon? Like the, like the. Keflon, like the pans. Yeah. Yeah. Like the no stick, right? Yeah. Like the no stick. Yeah. Like um, if you look at like, uh, uh, if you look at like the Trumps and the Bidens, they're like Teflon. Nothing seems to stick to either, either family. <laughs> they get to kind of do whatever they want. Almost like that. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, a lot of your politicians are Teflon. They're very, they're very uh, slippery. No, there are no slip surfaces. Nothing seems to stick to them. And then, yeah. um, I don't know, we've got all these blue collar people over here that seem to be opposite of Teflon. Very yeah. sticky, I guess. Yeah. But, uh, but your parent, yeah, so your dad worked in a factory and your mom worked in the hospital, correct? Yeah. yeah. And then all my, so all my cousins, my mom and dad, my aunts and uncles on my, and my mom all graduated from clay. So I always say to people, Oregon, Ohio, but then I spend a lot of time in Oregon on the West coast and they seem to be very cute, confused by it. And then the other crazy thing about it is my best friend who lives in Oregon in Oregon, um, John Watkins, he's a Genoa guy. I believe his sister's kids go to clay or went to clay. So it's like kind of a <laughs> wild thing, man. Cause yeah. Oregon, Ohio is, is just east of Toledo, and there's, like, a lot of refineries. Um, I think you guys, do you have that big, gigantic uh, steel thing, that big, gigantic tower where they, they melt the – is that in your district? Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's right outside of Oregon, right in between east Toledo and Oregon. Yeah, so my dad said they melt these, like, ignits, or he named what they were down. He was explaining it to me one day as he was driving me all around East Toledo and I was marveling at it. Um, Cause I mean, that's where my dad is from. So my dad, um, his first like five years of life, he grew up in like uh, off of Willard street um, in yeah. the East side. So, yeah. and then um, they moved out to Grissel road and um, um, it's Bay Shore is I believe what you guys call yeah. it. Right. Yep. Bay Shore. A lot of uh, the Millers definitely terrorized Bay Shore every october 31st i'm not gonna lie to you yeah <laughs> but, but so we used to trick or treat out there and i think people kind of knew but i think they knew that if they went and said something to my grandpa my papa bird it was probably game over oh yeah so, yeah and then that was the other crazy thing my best friend's mom and his his grandma actually grew up on grisel road in oregon ohio and like it's funny because he lives in I just outside of Portland, Oregon and Sandy, yes. Oregon. Now, um, I did an episode with him this summer. He's a, uh, lunatic whitewater rafter. So, um, and I think, uh, his niece dated one, uh, dated Ty Cobb. Oh, okay. It's like a small world, right? Yeah, it is a small world. Yeah. So there you go, man. My, my ties to, to the Oregon clay Eagles run deep. Let's just put it that way. That's good. Yeah, right. I, like I love to hear that. Got some names on the wall over there. I think my cousin, Jake, uh, my cousin, Buck, and then uh, 
Jake and Buck Miller. Yeah, they're yeah. here tonight for uh, youth practice. They were. Yeah. They helped. Oh, were uh, they? Yeah, they helped the youth club. Yeah, they're low key. They're low key guys. They're good guys. Great and guys. then um, my uh, uncle Dan was a GLL champ when they're in the Great Lakes League. Mm -hmm. So they're all over that that wall. Uh, all my cousins and stuff. So I go back uh, way back with Clay, obviously. And um, you guys have had some really good. Uh, obviously. You've had an NCAA champion and a, and a D1 All American, both at heavyweight, right? Yep. Yeah. So yeah, Garrett Gray, two time NCAA champ in Division Two, and Matt Stencil, uh, multiple time All American for Central Michigan. Yeah. Yeah. So Stencil, all, also only five time MAC champ in Mid American yeah. Conference history. Yeah. So um, those guys are both heavyweights. I don't think Stencil was a heavyweight for you guys. Um, I think uh, at the end of his senior year, if I recall, is 220 is what he wrestled. Yeah. Yeah. And he led the NCAA in pins. Oh, yeah. I think Gray might have led the NCAA yeah. in pins, too. They both did. Yeah, they Isn't both that did. wild? It is wild. We were just talking about that. Uh, me and Troy McLaughlin were just talking about that. We want to see, and I hope that these two watch it, we want to see Matt Stencil and Garrett Gray wrestle a little bit of go go live a little bit and 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 kind of see that match up a little we always talk about you know the the power of Garrett Gray and the the athletic ability of Matt Stencil and what a match that would be so um maybe during our alumni practice in a few weeks those guys they can come back we can Garrett's get massive though Garrett's massive Garrett's like uh he's a lot bigger well first off Garrett's like a postage stamp compared to his dad yeah. Dad is a massive yeah. human. Dad's one of the yeah. biggest human beings I know. His dad's bigger than most NFL linemen, right? Yeah. 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 When you shake their hands, it's like, yeah, you just, your hand gets crumpled. You know, it gets crushed. Oh, yeah. It's like it consumes your whole hand. It's like double banana hands. Yeah. Ridiculous. Uh, really good people, though. Great people. Garrett Gray coaches our middle school team. Does he? And then is he doing the turf? Is he doing turf now, too? Yeah. He works for Mommy Bay Turf. So what's crazy about him is he was your guys' – he was the school's first NCAA champion, obviously, Clay in Oregon, Ohio. And then he was also Tiffin's first NCAA champion in any sport. So it's kind of, like, wild what, like, you know, it's, somebody's got to do it, right? You need somebody to kick the door down. And Garrett Gray, what a better guy. What a nice guy, too. So he, and he tried yeah. the college wrestling, and then I think he found out, like you found out, uh, about the poverty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm That's sorry. Okay. The poverty is the college wrestling poverty is it's unacceptable yeah. to me. I'm just not it is unacceptable. Fan of it of the of the college wrestling poverty. Um they really work you guys hard. So as far as you, Justin, you are a clay grad, correct? Yep, two thousand nine graduated from here. So oh nine grad, who was your head coach? And my head coach was Jerry Anthony. So Jerry Anthony, and then so from Jerry Anthony, it went to Ralph Coverley, correct? Correct. And was Jerry? He was a Clay guy, wasn't he? Yeah, he was a Clay alumni. Um, he was a state placer for us, and also wrestled at, at uh, Hofstra um, during his time. He was a heavyweight at Hofstra, you know, varsity letter winner there at Hofstra. Wow, you guys had a Hofstra. I didn't even know that he was a Hofstra. Guy. Well, I remember my dad told me. He's like, yeah, this guy's he's really, he was really tough. And and he's like, he's a clay alum. And then I went into the dual meet, and I think Clay beat O'Carver in a dual meet. And it was O'Carver had really good teams. Yeah. It's like O'Carver had Ian Miller, Connor Witt. They had all these really good the, the Kramer brothers. One of the yeah. Kramers was an NCAA champion for uh Ashland. I mean, obviously O'Carver's got a good program too, but yeah. Who was your first – what Scrap Talk was your first state champion, Justin? Richie Scrap Talk. Richie. And then did Richie wrestle at Tiffin or the other one? There's... They both did. Richie both did went wrestling. to Michigan for a year or two, and then uh, Mike was already at Tiffin, Mike Scrap Talk. And then Richie transferred over to Tiffin and finished out there at Tiffin. But Richie Scrap Talk was the first state champion in clay history. Yes. And then was Stuntzel number two? Stencil was number two. We've only had two. Okay. And then, um, well, Garrett Gray lost a overtime barn burner. I don't, I don't know if he lost, but it's yeah. debatable. I'll put the match. I mean, yeah, it, yeah. it's kind of maddening. And it, he beat, well, he lost to Nick Tavanell and a lot of 50-50 calls in that one, man. A lot of, 
A lot of things could have gone uh, Garrett Gray's way, but I mean, I'll take the NCAA title if I'm him, though. You know what I mean? Because maybe that propelled him to that, right? You never know no. um, what people's journeys are like. But um, just real quick, it went from Ralph Coverly to you. Did Coach Coverly, he retired, and then talk to me about the process of you coming back to Clay. Yeah, so I was at St. Francis, like we talked about uh, a little earlier. And it was, uh, we had a good year there. And then uh, I saw on the Toledo Blade that uh, Ralph was retiring at the end of the year. And uh, obviously I've always had, um, always been passionate about the clay program. And so of course I was going to put my, um, my name in for the job and the process started going on and I, I felt good about it. And they, they announced me as the, as the head coach in May. And we kind of hit the round, ground running in May with the, with the guys doing some workouts. And um, that feels like it was yesterday. And now we're a week into the season. So um, it's been a great transition. Uh, you know, we got strong numbers right now. We're uh, sitting about 53 boys on the team and uh, nine girls. So um, been putting a lot of work in that way, building the roster up. And, um, yeah, I'm just – I'm so uh, grateful for the opportunity. I didn't. I never really thought it would uh, come. I, I. You talk about the college thing. I thought I would. I was gonna stay in uh, coaching college for the rest of my life. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm sure glad to be here and and be back with this program and and just so thankful for not only Mr. Anthony and Troy and Mark Beach who kind of laid a lot of the the groundwork and the foundation for this thing, but also for Ralph and. You know, he really elevated the program when he took over and kind of set a new standard um, for clay wrestling. And uh, he's one of the, you know, go down to one, one of the greatest coaches in Ohio. Um, and so just, you know, very grateful for him can, keeping the program up and not e even that, but elevating it as well. So is Mark Beach your guys' head athletic director? Yeah, this is his uh, last year. He's retiring at the end of the year. So Mark's going to retire. Troy has been coaching there. Troy McLaughlin coached my cousin Buck yeah. in, the, in the 80s and 90s. He's been there. That guy, hey, you know what? He owes me an episode of this, by the way. Let it, I mean, I'm sure he's going to watch, hopefully, or listen. And, uh, I, told him, I told him this morning uh, that you, he owed you one. So Yeah, oh, he's going yeah, he, he's gonna, to he's gonna have to get back at me because that guy, I tell you what, they don't make him like, like, like a Troy McLaughlin anymore. That guy is a selfless guy. He's been around that program. He was with you last year at St. Francis. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, you're right. He was with me at St. Francis. He came over and, and helped me out. And it's just, uh, yeah, I mean, the behind the scenes stuff that you wouldn't even imagine coach Troy takes care of. He knows to take care of it. And, um, he'll put all of his effort in, into the sport of wrestling. He's just, He's great. And not only does he do that with wrestling here, he does it with the football program too. He was here tonight for the fall sports awards. So he's just, uh, he bleeds, um, bleeds green and yellow. And um, yeah, glad to have him back with me here at clay. So, you know, what's wild. You guys know your scoreboard. Yeah. My uncle's made your scoreboard. Okay. My the uncle Og and I think my uncle Og and my uncle Dan made the scoreboard. At Clay. I don't think they would let my dad around it because my dad's kind of a hack. Yeah. I don't let my dad and my papa further around it because they're kind of hacky. They're yeah. They're not craftsmen, but they made that scoreboard. Dude, that scoreboard's unbelievable. Does the eye still light up? Yep. And they still, you know, we have a brand new one um, that's got, you know, it's a, it's newer. It's got, you know, all the sponsors on, but they kept the old one and they still run it. So, yeah, the eyes still light up. And Yep. Um, my uncle's made that. Yeah, awesome. So that's like awesome. No, and my uncle Oak, my uncle Oak actually qualified for um, maybe the last year or the first year they created divisions in Ohio. He qualified for the state tournament. Okay. For Clay. So I mean, and then my cousins Kirk and Matt, they both wrestled on and off. I don't think they finished high school wrestling, but they wrestled at Clay as well. So like, obviously, I just go so far back. My uncle Jeff, he lives in Hawaii now. He wrestled at Clay. He wrestled at Eisenhower and Clay. So it's like, yeah. it's just like super deep. I like talking Clay wrestling and I like, like uh, the fact that, you know, that they brought an alum back mm -hmm. in yourself and I love it, but let's talk about, I know, I know I, I joke and I say that college wrestling is poverty. They just don't pay you guys very well. 
And it's no. not about the money. And I get that. I 100% get that, right? Talk about your journey from Clay. And then was it Heidelberg right out of college, right out of high school for you? Yeah, Heidelberg. Yep. So, so Heidelberg, who were your coaches at Heidelberg when you were at Was it Coach Miller? Yeah, I had Coach, uh, yeah, Coach Miller for a okay. year. And uh, my wife played volleyball for Coach Miller at Heidelberg. Um, and he was there for a year. And that's after that year, he stepped down, went volleyball full time. And we had Nate Shear for a year. Um, and then he took a job elsewhere. And then in comes Ned Shuck. Uh, you know, for me, it was like my third coach in three years. And it's kind of it's kind of a little crazy. Right. But in comes this this guy, Ned Shuck from old Minnesota. And um, and yeah, he does a, a, a fantastic job. And him and I throughout my time at Heidelberg got to build a pretty great friendship, which then led on to, to me going with him to Whitewater. So did you coach any years at Heidelberg? I coached two years at Heidelberg. Okay. Yeah, one, with Shuck. One with, with Ned. And then um, I was in the middle of grad school when he in, initially got the Whitewater job. And so I just, I stayed and finished up grad school at Heidelberg. And then it just so happened that as I finished up, he had his full-time assistant position open up and um, I went out and, and joined that Whitewater. Okay. So was it Patrizzi after Shuck? Is that how it went with the coaching? Then it was Patrizzi. Yep. Yeah. So I, I coached a year with Tony. Okay. So Tony is Tony, Tony is still the head coach at Heidelberg. Yep. And he's still the head coach. And a, and a crazy story about that is Tony, when I was in high school, was the, a volunteer coach at Heidelberg and was actually one of the first coaches I met. I was like a junior or something. And I just went out there for an open mat and he was one of the first Heidelberg coaches that I met. And so kind of came f- full circle four or five years later, we're coaching together at Heidelberg. Did you have any crossover with Boomer Fetchko? Was he on he was- the team? He was uh, right before me. His senior year was my senior year of high school, but he came back quite a bit. Talked to Boom. I talked to Boomer a couple of weeks ago about a few of our athletes, and so uh, Boomer's another great guy. Boomer's a really good dude. I used to uh, at the Burnett camps. I don't know if you came to any of our Burnett camps. I don't think you did. Did you? No. No. So we were with the Burnett camps. We were out in this barn in Lagrange at the Piecraft's house. And then um, Jimmy and Johnny Pycraft's parents and um, Jim and Donna Pycraft built Eric Burnett this barn and built him an apartment in it. And that's kind of how Burnett train started. And then we moved the Burnett train. Well, not we. I was just like an employee. I was a toilet plunger and a mat mopper. (laughs) And uh, we moved. Well, not we. Sorry. The Burnett's moved to uh, where they are in Milan now at uh, Artie Wolf's place at the weed and feed and it's this big massive five mat facility in this guy's warehouse and uh yeah they they uh have upped their game but i used to have boomer as a little kid but he wasn't really a little kid i, I thought he was like a like my kid's age he was a freshman in high school boomer only, he only weighed like he wasn't 100 pounds i remember yeah. boomer is like my son my six-year-old son ferdinand size in reality, he was like a 70 or 80 pound eighth, ninth grader. So he was just yeah. tiny. And I and, and Boomer used to break dance. Boomer oh, really? used to like do crazy break dance. And he said he broke that. it out about five, 10 years ago and it didn't go so well for him. Yeah. <laughs> like hurt his wrist or something. I don't even say it. He's like, yeah, it didn't go so well for me. But so Boomer was a D2 All American at Finley. And then he, I think he was a qualifier at Heidelberg. That sounds right. Yeah. Yeah, and he was part of a good team at Heidelberg. You know, they had Boomer. They had, uh, I'm sure you remember Joe Flug. Um, Joe Flug won it, the Maple yeah. Heights guy. Flug won it. had Zach Miser. Um, Miser was a runner-up, wasn't he? Yeah, but not the year Flug won it. Um, it was a, it was the, the next year. Uh, Figliano, they had they had some guys. Um, Brubeck, they had Bob Brubeck. Yeah. Um, Tony Crothers. Uh, there were some good Heidelberg teams. I, I don't know if you remember. You did a. You actually did a, a dual meet out there once. I did. And, Who did you guys that, wrestle? Uh, they wrestled Wilmington. I think when Wilmington was was kind of down. And Wilmington um, dropped dropped and brought back then. It was right before they dropped. I think right before they dropped and then they brought back. And they still have it. 
They still have it, yeah. They still have it. I mean, dude, it's hard to keep up That's with it anymore, man. That's hard. Because um, Urbana had it, and then the school went – the school, yeah. like, closed. Somebody, Some online school bought them. Franklin yeah. University, I think, bought Urbana. Does that sound right? Sounds right, yeah. So weird. But, like, yeah, and all the stuff, like, all the meanderings and things I've done. I've worked with Tiffin. I've worked with Heidelberg. I like promoting D2 and D3 wrestling, NAI, JUCO. I think it's, like, an awesome way to do it. And I think that the problem that Flow Wrestling has that they're starting mm-hmm. to figure out is um, you can't just ignore half of your market. Yeah. No, you can't you ignore can't. over half of your market, which is, yeah. like yeah. I just oh. said, D2, D3, NAIA, JUCO, because when you just ignore them, what are you th- – you're telling that only the 70-some D1s matter? And that's not how you grow the sport. And um, I would always try and like cover things and they'd always be like, Hey, why are you doing that? Or when it was Martin Floriani, he didn't care. He was like, Oh, do Mount union and John Carroll or whatever. He didn't care. He was like wrestling's wrestling, promote wrestling. And then as um, the company grew that I don't think that they were really, uh, they just didn't care. You know what I mean? They, They just didn't see any purpose to it. They were all D1 crazy. And, uh, I know like a Mark Bader, he was cool with it. He didn't care. Joe Williams, but, but as they started adding more people, they're like, why, who cares about D2 and D3? Yeah. Now they're figuring it out. And I think they're starting to rank it and stuff like that. Yeah, I, th- I think what people don't realize too, even maybe here in Ohio, go to a D3 on a Tuesday night and, and watch Baldwin Wallace against Mount Union. And you're going to see it. You're going to see a Decatur out there for Baldwin Wallace. You're going to yeah. see some, you're going to see some good dudes out there wrestling and getting after it. And so, and there's some great coaches in our Ohio D3 schools, you know, Ryan Riggs and, and Jamie Gibbs and uh, Josh Malave and Tony Patrizzi and um, the list. I mean, I, you know, I think of that whole OAC, there's some some great coaches in there. So um, I got a lot of love, obviously, for, for Division three and Division two wrestling. And Mount St. Joe had an NCAA champ last year. Yeah. You know, uh, and, um, yeah. I mean, they, they're doing a great job down there and they're changing the culture. Yeah. I'm um, really impressed with that coach being able to do. Yeah, they, they do a really nice job. I got to give them a lot of credit. Obviously, uh, Beecham transferred back to – he's a he, he is a Cincinnati guy, and he transferred back to Cincinnati from Notre Dame College where he qualified. And he is uh, a freak and fun to watch and a good kid and wrestles hard. And Mount St. Joseph does a good job. I, uh, Coach Mason, right? Yeah, Coach Mason. Charles yeah. Mason does a good job. Um, so that you know, shout out to them. And I don't know, uh, Josh, my guy Josh here. Josh wrestled at Mount St. Joe. He's a big supporter of Mount St. Joe and, and Barbarian Apparel. So shout out to Mount St. Joe. Had their first NCAA champ last year. They're doing a great job. And like you said, I geez, I think four teams in Ohio had NCAA finals last year. John Carroll, BW, Mount St. Mount Joe, Union. and then Mount, uh, uh, Mount had a champ with uh, James. So I yeah, mean, James wow. brothers, those guys are good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, what's well, crazy to think about it? You know, I had uh, Coach Haywald on the podcast uh, mm-hmm. a couple weeks ago. It was before they uh, wrestled uh, Lake Erie College, and uh, he talked a lot about how Iowa has no problem with uh, Augsburg. And Wartburg, you know, uh, Augsburg's in uh, Minneapolis, and then yeah. Wartburg's in Waverly, Iowa. So yeah. anyhow, and then they got Loris. They've got all these other – they've got the Iowa D3 conference yeah. is unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, crazy. Dubuque. I mean, I can't even think of all of them off the top of my head, but um, they do a really good – a co-college. Yep. He's helped me Simpson. out here. But Simpson, Simpson. yeah, you, you get it. Yes, yes. They do a really good job. Um Anyhow, where does Spencer Lee's dad work? Uh, is it Co or Simpson? His dad works at Co Simpson. No, or... he works at one of the D three schools. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, uh, Spencer Lee's dad is like an administrator there. Oh, like, wow. like vice president of the college or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And anyhow, um, Co Hawks, right? Is it, is yeah, it Co Hawks. Yeah, I believe it's Co. Anyhow. I could have that wrong, but I'm pretty sure Larry Lee works right there because that's not far from Iowa City, right? No, no, not yeah. far at all. I, I believe it's Co. Anyhow, he said he made a great point. Haywald said those schools, those D3 schools, Augsburg, Wartburg, and then all the Iowas we just named, 
there's not this negative stigma that like where every kid is, oh, I'm a D1 guy. I'm a D1 mm-hmm. guy. Everybody thinks they're a D1 guy. And the reality of that is not everybody's a D1 guy. As you, as you yourself know, um, not everybody's a D1 guy. And uh, the opportunities are shrinking in D1. I mean, I know they're trying to preserve it, but like they'll make, they'll gain some ground, Long Island or Cal Baptist or someone will transition mm-hmm. up. Then somebody drops, right? Eastern yeah. Michigan drops, whatever. But you get my point. Like D2 and D3, NAIA, obviously with Lords College in Toledo, you guys know oh, that no. there's still quality wrestling there. I think you guys got a, a Henneman at Lords is really good, right? Yeah, well, he just graduated there, and he's actually coaching down at the University of Finley right now. And then we had uh, Garrett Anderson wrestle for Lords, who was a couple times state qualifier for us, and he's back on staff here at Clay, uh, teaching in the in the school district as well. So, yeah, Lords is doing a great job right now, pulling in local talent, kind of getting some transfers here and there. Um, yeah, that coaching staff's doing a fantastic job. How do you draw a guy like that? Like, how do you get a guy like that on your staff to come back? get a teaching job and what does that do for clay wrestling when you're able to get alumni and college wrestlers to come back and help you oh man it's huge you know the alumni they just uh the way i they have a different um you know feeling for the program it's a little bit different passion a little bit different commitment they have their own experiences when they went through the program that they can share and with the staff as we make decisions and that they can share with uh the athletes as well and then you know, getting someone on like Garrett, who was a couple of times state qualifier, he wrestled in college um, and, you know, his experience with that and him being able to share that with uh, with our athletes has, has been huge. And he's been doing a great job and, and is super appreciative of it. But, you know, our whole staff is built with uh, Clay alumni. You know, I got obviously the young guys on staff like Troy McLaughlin and Mark Beach and Matt Medina, uh, but then us older guys like myself, uh, Garrett Anderson, uh, Josh Nagy. Did you just uh, call those guys the younger guys? I think you might have yeah. that up. I think you called I, – I don't know if I did my – did I hear that right? Did you just call – Yeah, 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 you just yeah the younger guys. Are you guys. to see if I'm listening? Because, I, listen, yeah. I, you call the – you can't call Troy McLaughlin – a young guy, because I, here's the thing Troy McLaughlin will tell you. I remember when Zeb was at wrestling meets, like how my kids are running around. He'll say that to you. He'll be like, I probably, he'll, he probably remembers me and all the stuff as a little kid. And dude, I'm yeah. old. I'm 43. And Troy's in great shape still, man. Troy's awesome. Yeah, he's still wrestling. He's still in shoes and knee pads every I day. I love it. I love so. it. And how old's Mark? Is Mark older than – he's not older than Troy, is he? They're about the same age. I'm not going to say which one is older because they're going to be listening and I'm going to have to hear it, you know. So, hey, I'm we're just, not live. We can edit this. Don't worry. They're the same age. I love it. I mean, two great guys. Two two guys, when I think of Clay Eagles, I think of those guys. And I just like I – lo- I think that those guys are just so good for what you yeah. guys have done there. And to bring you back, man, and for you to bring back – um Who's the guy from Lords that's on uh, that's teaching there and on staff with you? Who is that? Garrett, yeah, Garrett Anderson. Garrett Anderson, and, and and he's a clay guy. He's a clay and, guy. And he went out and he got a degree, and now he's yeah. back. What's he teach? He teaches math. Math. He's like my wife. He likes. And he's a math and science guy. He can teach. Oh you yeah, he likes math. spreadsheets and, and yeah, and never-ending math problems. Good for those guys. <laughs> Good for those folks. <laughs> um, I had a math kid on Kent State. Has a, a guy. He had a math major. I was like, oh, you like being bored and frustrated. Good for you. I'm not that man. I'm I'm a yeah. I'm a, a, a I was a history teacher and now I'm I'm uh, careers and uh, career based intervention and uh, I'll take it. I'll stick with career based intervention and social studies over math any day of the week. But so, what are you teaching? I'm teaching health and PE. Okay, and all the places you've been between Heidelberg and Whitewater, what, de- where do you have degree? You got a degree from uh, Heidelberg. Do you got a, yeah. a degree from Whitewater? Nope. I got, no, just from Heidelberg. Just from Heidelberg. Okay. And eventually, you know, with all the coaching that you do, you know, at some point in there, you, you're eventually going to go back to school. I'm pretty sure you're pretty, uh, I guess, aware of that. Cause that's what, how education works. Yeah. Are you a school guy or not a school guy? Um, you know, I, I'm a school guy. I, I, I like to learn. Um, 
now. I'll say that about myself now. Maybe when I was in high school, I liked wrestling a little bit more. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm grateful that I had Troy and, and Mr. Anthony and Mark to say, no, you need to do this school stuff too. But, um, yeah, I'm a school guy. I, I like to, to read and try to learn and, um, and, and, and get better at certain things. So. Did your dad ever hit you with, you're going to be working with me at the Teflon factory. If you don't get things straight, did he ever give you that? It was, yeah, that was since I was little. And then when I was in high school, I worked, I did some masonry for a few summers, putting oh. together foundations and things like that. And so I loved the work. It was great. It was a good exercise, but, um, really ultimately when I was young, I knew I wanted to coach. And so I knew the easiest way to coach would be to get an education degree. And then through coaching, I found out I like helping, you know, the, the youth and the younger, the younger generation. And so well, what better to do that than through education and teaching? Okay. So my dad, my Papa Ferd, he lived on Grisal Road. My dad, my cousin Jake now, my brother Ferd. And um, geez, my brother Chad was for like a cup of coffee. They're all iron workers. Oh, yeah. yeah. My dad told me, you better go to school because if you've got to be an iron worker, you and your family are going to starve. That's what my dad told me. I appreciated his honesty. Yeah. And, I'm, and, I, and I'm very, I'm an honest person with myself a lot. Yeah, he wasn't wrong. I probably would have yeah. starved, and my kids would have starved, and I wouldn't have been able to provide uh, the spread that I currently have here in Auburn Township in yeah. Chicago County. I probably wouldn't have been able to do it. So, shout out to my dad for the uh, brutally yeah. honest advice um, that I didn't become an iron worker because I would have starved, and my family would have, and he yeah. wasn't wrong. So, um, yeah, they, well, the rest of the world appreciates that too because we appreciate what you do with all well, of this. I, I appreciate that, but listen, I didn't want to be a local 55er, <laughs> dude. Local 55's got some guys. The yeah. Blazes dad is a local 55er, and their grandpa and their great grandpa, yeah. The Blazes, I mean, you look at the trade, the trades our, are just so strong over there, you know what I mean? Our youth coach, Mark Orth, who was a state uh placer for us, he's a, a local 55 guy. So you remember Mark Orth, you know, and shifting gears, obviously, to something that uh, recently happened over in one of your refineries there. You guys lost a couple of alum who were, I think, were those guys sheet workers? What was their, they were, they were union guys, weren't they? They were union guys, but um, yeah, Ben and Max Morrissey, um, two teammates of mine, best friends of mine. We lost them. Uh, yeah, they worked for BP Refinery, actually. Um, yeah, we lost them in the. Uh, I don't know, it was maybe a month and a half ago in the in the BP refinery fire. So, yeah, it was a tough day. It's, it's been a tough couple months for the Oregon community. And they wrestled for Clay as well, correct? Yeah, yeah. Max was a year older than me, and Ben was my age. And, yeah, we were drill partners. We were, uh, you know, in each other's weddings. And so, um, yeah, there's a – yeah, we, you know, went to the, you know, the showing and everything, and, and – the whole community was out for it. And yeah, it's, you know, we're still mourning, uh, mourning that loss. And um, same with Troy and Mark and all the coaches that spent time with Ben and Max, um, the two great people. Um, you know, they used to go on those Lake Erie wrestling trips with us and things like that. And so lots of memories, lots of stories, but um, yeah, yeah, tough, tough, tough loss here in Oregon. Uh, if you look over my shoulder here, you can see the singlet hanging up. Do you see it? Yeah. So that is for Edison, former Edison Charger. Uh, that is for Max Soviak, who was killed in Afghanistan yeah. when we were coming out of Afghanistan, when, when the United States of America was withdrawing, I want to say last August 2021. Yeah. He was the Navy corpsman that was with the Marines that was um, killed outside the airport in um i think it was cabal afghanistan i think i've got that right and uh he was killed uh by a suicide bomber i believe and uh barbarian apparel made singlets and then that is it's a it's a uh it's a uh stars and stripes singlet i have another one around here somewhere i wish i could have it i'm in my uh my office my recording studio right now and i have it and it's not like it's a big office there's just a lot of things in here 
there's a lot of stuff in my office. Um, yeah. A lot of cool things, though. You know, once again, shout out to my dad. You know, he's uh, still kicking over there on uh, Nissan Road. Which Nissan Road is the border between Genoa. It's the end of Clay. Mm-hmm. Clay, it dead ends in the Brown Road. Yeah. And then um, it uh, it's the Genoa Oak Harbor border, and Clay is a border. And then it goes all the way to uh, Elmore. Mm-hmm. I think we were closer to Clay High School. We were closer to Clay High School. We were closer to Genoa High School. We were closer to Lake High School. We were closer to Elmore High School. And we might have been about the same distance to, uh, well, I mean, we were closer to Northwood. And we were almost, Eastwood, we were almost closer to. But, like, we were closer to all those schools than we were Oak Harbor, I want to say. Okay. Kind of wild because we were out there. We were way yeah. out there because that district's massive. It is, yeah. But shout out to my dad. Here he is uh, riding the John, Do- John Deere tractors. Awesome. He's got one of my sons, and I've got the other one. I think he's got the one that's named after him, Thomas. So, and uh, they're kind of they kind of act like like two knuckleheads. So uh, I think we we hit the name jackpot on that because he really acts a lot like my dad, like a complete goofball knucklehead. He was like street fighting tonight at wrestling. <laughs> you got any kids wrestling yet? No, no, I got a little one, but uh, she's only just about to be two. So not much wrestling there yet. Yeah, it's coming. If you have them around it enough, there's going to be some wrestling. Like they just, I found the biggest thing is if you have kids around it, it's the best, like kind of, uh, I guess, outlet for them. And then they they see a lot of it and they just kind of gravitate towards it. But like, I don't, I'm not trying to get my kids to compete a bunch and do a bunch of stuff. So I just like having them around. And I think the sport of wrestling is just good for kids and, uh, you know, what, what it does for them. But you said you had youth practice tonight. How many kids do you have on the youth team at uh, Clay? Uh, we have three different groups going. So we have like uh, our advanced group, our elite group, uh, and our rookie group, and then itty bitty, we call it. It's like our six and under we're uh, about 80 kids, all three combined. That's pretty so good. 80. That's pretty good. Yeah. And numbers, I think the biggest thing with youth, talking to Mark Haywald, it's not about weeding kids out. I think it's having as big of a roster as you can have. And then the kids eventually, and it, you you know how this is, man. It just eventually. Yeah. It sounds like you're doing well with your high school, 53 on the roster right now. Yeah, 53, uh, 53 guys and nine girls. So pretty good so you've got 62 athletes out mm-hmm. right now and wrestling will be sanctioned for girls this year what does that do for you and do you have a girls head coach or, or do you assume both roles um well we have a large staff we have about eight nine people on staff and yeah we just kind of consume that um i have uh, lucas roach who's also an alumni here of clay who has kind of taken that head role for me a little bit um, and he's been doing a great job, but ultimately, you know, there's days where coach Troy's working with the girls or whatever it may be. We all kind of just jump in and, and do what we can to provide them a, a good experience. That's good. I mean, building the girls team is important. Obviously having an equal, it's like, you know, you have a track and a cross country, you have, obviously they're, they're mirroring teams mm-hmm. and you have to have that. And now that wrestling's doing that, it obviously creates more opportunities more athletes, more eyeballs on the sport. So yeah, why not? Right. Why not? Mm-hmm. I think that you, you've got to do that and it had to happen. And it was wild. Scott Moore was on and he said that Pennsylvania has not sanctioned girls wrestling yet. I was like, what? Oh, yeah. That's mind blowing. Yeah, I just, I was just looking the other day and um, someone tweeted, I, I don't know how true this is, but as of, you know, this last week, there was 2000 girls entered into track wrestling for this season uh and last year the season ended with a thousand girls and so Amazing. we've already dub- already doubled our numbers throughout the country i think that's great and it's just going to continue to to increase I'm, I'm real excited about it um more opportunities growing the sport advancing the sport that's what we need so you know obviously you guys have a, a, a huge setback you lose two alumni um in the morrissey's and then you know, you're, you're, you're best friends with these guys. You're in their weddings and you're trying to like gain a vision and get your head wrapped around being the head coach, there, new teacher in the district. 
what is your vision and how have you been able to handle that and move on into you guys are, you know, you got really good D one teams there. You're in a great district. Uh, obviously mm -hmm. Perrysburg's got a great program. D one wrestling's pretty good in Northwest Ohio. What's the vision? How do you take the loss of your friends and kind of build off of, you've got all this alumni and all the support and how do you take that? You got a tragic thing like that. You do something like this with a singlet. How do you honor those guys? And how do you get towards your goals and your vision of clay wrestling? Yeah, well, we're, we're, you know, we've been in talks since obviously the tragic events with the Morrissey's on, you know, ways to honor them and, and some different things we can do, uh, especially with our youth tournament and how we can uh, maybe rename that. Um, but, we, you know, we've, you know, we've talked about that with, with the team and, um, just, you know, being grateful for our opportunities day in and day out, you know, that we get to come in and practice and, you know, hang out with our friends and, and people that we're going to be surrounded with for the rest of our life and, and not taking any of that for granted and, and using that as some motivation to, to get everything we can out of this workout or out of the study hall or whatever it may be. Um, been a lot of talk about gratitude with all of that and, and being grateful for our situation because, um, at, at any minute it can change, right. And, and it can be different. So, um, that's kind of been the focus there. And then, you know, the vision for the program is just to, um, continue to, um, grow in all facets, right. Having a strong roster size, growing the, um, you know, obviously there's competition and goes, right. We want to, you know, win the conference. We want to have a lot of, you know, state qualifiers, state champs, state placers. But at the end of the day, um, we want these guys to be uh, fall in love with the sport, um, retain them and get them involved in, in, in freestyle and Greco and kind of get the Lake Erie wrestling club back going in the spring. And, um, um, developing them that way because we, we, we have a lot of strong wrestlers. We have um, a handful of guys who are going to go to the state tournament and, and probably have a lot of success, but um, you know, we have a lot of green guys, a lot of new guys and um, how can we uh, develop them? How can we help them grow? Because what a lot of people don't know when we talk, talked about Garrett Gray earlier is, you know, Garrett didn't, you know, his freshman year, he wasn't a starter, you know, sophomore year wasn't, he didn't really get into the lineup until his junior year of high school. And look, you know, look what he became just by, you know, being in the system for four years. And so, you know, how can we retain the, the 28 freshmen that we have right now? How can we keep those guys through our system all four years? Um, so, you know, right now, yeah, maybe they're a first year wrestler, but by, you know, their senior year, they're, they're having a lot of success. And so, um, you know, that's, that's been the vision is just um, getting these guys in, retaining them, helping them fall in love with the sport um, and providing them as many opportunities to go out and compete as we can, you know, go out to obviously our in season stuff, but then we go to Disney throughout the summer and uh, different freestyle events throughout the state and uh, a few other trips. So um, I want to build that up and uh, continue to, to build this alumni support, get these alumni back, you know, have alumni on staff, have alumni, events, alumni nights, alumni practices, um, because when you talk to people who wrestled for this program, um, they usually have a lot of good things to say, whether that's, you know, Buck Miller, whether that's myself, Lonnie Rivera, Garrett Gray, um, Jason Munzer, Troy McLaughlin, whoever it may be, um, you know, we've all been impacted uh, by this program in some way, and it's helped us grow in our life, and so let's get all those people back and kind of share those memories and, and, and put, you know, move that forward, pass that along to, to the next group coming through. Speaking of Lonnie Rivera, Lonnie was the interim superintendent for the state of Ohio department of education. Did you know that? Yeah. He's scoop. Yeah, he's he big was the time. top guy <laughs> in all of education in the state of Ohio. Lonnie Rivera, who was a, a state finalist for you guys. He's a yep. MAC champ and an EWL champ, I want to say. Yeah, I know he was a MAC champion. I, I would assume EWL champ as well. And Well, you got to watch what you're assuming about the EWL because EWL's nails, dude. Yeah, yeah. Well, and he was my uh, 
my first principal when I moved into the Oregon School District, um, when I moved in from the east side. So Lonnie Rivera, uh, a lot of respect, a lot of, of uh, yeah, a lot of respect for that guy. So super humble guy. And yeah, the very. wildest thing is, I don't think he like, I think all, all these, like you have a lot of people that do administration. It's a race to the top to find the superintendent job. And ultimately yeah. a lot of them, when you get into those big, like Menor, Westlake, uh, what's, you know, what's the biggest Perrysburg, you look at these, all, all the old Tangies, uh, Cincinnati, oh. Anderson, Mason down there. Those schools are massive, right? You get in, obviously all the Pickerington's in Columbus, uh, the Westervilles, they want to be the superintendents of those jobs. And I think the up from those jobs would be like working in ODE, mm-hmm. part, State Department of Education. And I don't think that guy cared for it. I don't think that dude, I don't think Leonard, I can't speak for him. I don't know either. But I don't think that he wanted to be the superintendent of the state of Ohio. And I think he works at like an, an educational service center now, I want to say, in like Ottawa County somewhere. I'm pretty sure that's what my brother told me last time I had heard about him. But what an awesome guy, super athletic, unorthodox, mm-hmm. big guy, right? So yeah, yeah. that always helps. And a great family. The Rivera's a great family. Really good. I think yeah. dad's Abe, I want to say. Mm-hmm. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So they're just like really good people. And it's like crazy to see the people who went to clay with my parents. And my dad is always like dropping some like knowledge of on me about he's a clay guy. And I'm like, hey, all right, cool, man. Uh, talk about Lake Erie freestyle. Talk about what yeah. Troy McLaughlin did with that. Talk about why it went away and why it's coming back. Yeah. Well, what, Coach Troy didn't, and I'm sure you were around for some of that early stuff. I used to you take know. Ian to it. I used to take yeah. my nephew Ian. We would go, and it was in the the old elementary yeah. school. Old elementary. There was a stage, and I used to take Ian in there, and then we had this locker room that was like an old office. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know what I'm talking, right? <laughs> like, it was a cool – dude, that was a cool wrestling room. I think uh, – and we have a great facility. I'm sure you've seen our wrestling room now. Beautiful facility. But that is one of my favorite wrestling rooms. With the, with it was, the, it had it all. It was first, awesome. And then the, oh yeah, it was really. It had cool. the cement. It had the cement seats. It had. Yeah. It was cool. Yeah. So well, Troy started that. I, I mean, in the late '90s, I, I think um, he started the the freestyle club. And at the time, it was the only freestyle club in Northwest Ohio. When I started to get involved into it, you know, my sixth, seventh grade year, we had kids coming from Sandusky, St. Mary's. I remember like. You know, the, you know, some of the Hermes that were Herms that were at St. Mary's would come over. We'd have obviously Oak Harbor would be there. And uh, and so he kind of had, you know, this club going and he would take teams out to the junior AAU Junior Olympics. And they won a couple of national championships with with some teams. And um, it grew so big. He had, I don't know, three, four five sites at one time. He had a Bowling Green, a Delta site, a clay site. Um, all over the place. And, you know, when I was in high school is when it was really going like that. And this is, you know, speaks to Coach Troy and, and who he is. He um, he traded in, I don't know if you know this, he traded in his car when we were in high school for a 15 passenger van so he could take us around the state to different practices. And he took us to every freestyle state qualifier in Ohio. And, um, yeah, he would just load up on Friday and we'd go wrestling all weekend. And so, but yeah, so Troy got that going. And then I, I don't, I'm not sure why it went away or, or kind of what happened with that. I was in Wisconsin kind of when that, um, when that happened, but I truly believe that the Lake Erie wrestling program was, um, instrumental in the success of the clay wrestling program. You know, when you can have a club like that right in your, in your own wrestling room and, you know, Mondays and Wednesdays throughout the spring, you can wrestle with all the best guys in Northwest Ohio, similar to what's going on with, um, with Scotty and Perrysburg right now. They're doing a great job with BTW. Um, but when you can have that in your backyard every Monday, Wednesday, you have no you know choice, but to get a little bit better. And so um, we're looking to bring that back. I, I'd love to, to work again with some of the same schools we worked with in the past that are kind of on this side of the river um, and just, you know, give us another opportunity to, to, to train and get better and make Northwest Ohio better. And I think that's what, you know, I love, you, you mentioned the D1, you know, how tough D1 wrestling is in, in the area. 
and it is, is because we have some great coaches in the area with Scotty at Perrysburg and, and Coach Fowler at Whitmer and, um, you know, Coach Donnelly, who was at Anthony Wayne, another clay guy, alum. Right? Yeah, another clay guy, right? And what he's built Anthony Wayne up to be, and, and they're they're strong, they're competitive. And um, there's a lot more coaches like that in, in Wauseon and Delta. And, and um, you know, we want to continue to build and build and um, because – your side of the state, there's some tough D1 schools over there as well. And if we want to go to Columbus and, and beat those guys and, and have a lot of success, uh, we need to get a little bit better. So, Here's what I've noticed about this side of the state. They've had a lot of uh, iconic generational coaches yeah. that have retired. And if you look, Jamie Milkovich is a Maple Heights guy. Yep. You look at Jamie Milkovich, you look at, I think he just retired from uh, teaching, still does some wrestling, but like you got a guy like Tony DiGiovanni mm-hmm. at Solon. He's not there anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, you look at all these guys and you, you just start going through the list. Greg Urbis, St. Edward. I mean, obviously coach, uh, coach Heffernan's a pretty, he's a pretty yeah. that cup. <laughs> but if you look at it, you've had all these guys who've been in it for so long. Dave Riggs, Maslin Perry. A good one, yeah. You know, and it's like what you're doing is such a marathon, man. It's not this horse race. And you look at the longevity of the longevity of the guys I just named. I mean, dude, it's just so hard. It's so hard to like you're in your room still. It's 9 30. And it's just and you're doing it because you want to promote clay wrestling. You want people to see that I know a lot about clay wrestling, and clay right. wrestling is very worthy. And you can win in clay and in Oregon, Ohio, you can, you can be a national champ. You can be a state champ. I think the belief system and what you're doing, and it's just like, you're just building the foundation. Now it's just so much time and energy and it's so thankless. And a lot of parents have really unrealistic goals for their kids. And I just think it's, I, it's, it's, it's an admirable thing. What you're doing, you know, coaching, are you doing a spring sport? I don't even know. Are you doing, you know, like, yeah, no, Lake Erie. Lake Erie, Lake Erie I hope, right? I hope it's just that. I and mean, that's me being yeah. selfish about the sport of wrestling, but like it's just so hard what you're doing. And I just, I, I mean, everybody thinks that everybody wants to do what you're doing. I don't want to do what you're doing because it's a ton of hours. It's pennies on the hours. You're not doing it for the money. Obviously, it's a little better set up than the D3, D2 wrestling thing where it's yeah. like life of poverty and you just have to be thrifty with your money. The D one thing, man, ain't even that that good of a deal. A lot of those guys aren't even making that good of money. So yeah. it's just crazy to think what you're getting yourself into, but you're like you're 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 ready for it. You love it. You're passionate about it. And that that that's like the big thing I like to see, Coach Wharton. I just like I get fired up about it that someone like you wants to do that and wants clay wrestling to be great. And you're and you're local. You're a local guy. You're yeah. a clay guy, and it's awesome. I love it. Um. Beyond Lake Erie, Freestyle Wrestling Club, bringing that back. What else do you think you guys got to do to jump levels, to start nipping at the heels of the Maslin Perrys, the Brexvilles, the obviously the Illyrias, the Perrysburgs, the uh, Whitmer's got a great program like you mentioned. What do you got to do to start nipping at the heels of those guys? And obviously St. Edwards is a whole other tier up. Dublin Kaufman, you know, these programs, what do you got to do to get on their level? I think we need to, you know, Obviously, we already talked about the freestyle and Greco, but we need large participation in that. And that goes for, I, I believe, throughout the state. If you want you guys to get better and have better results in the winter, they need to be wrestling the USA Wrestling Ohio Freestyle Circuit. And I don't, I, I don't, I, I don't know if there's any other way, in, in my opinion. But we got to get a big participation in, in freestyle and Greco this spring. But um, you know, besides that, we have to continue to use the resources that are in our backyards and, and find opportunities to go train with with those Perrysburg guys, the guys that we're competing with on Saturday, because they got some 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 dudes over there. They got some hammers that, um, you know, can make us better. Um, and then we just, uh, man, like you said, it's a grind. It's a journey. And, you know, focusing on the guys that we have now and, and helping them fall in love, but then also, you know, the 87, 85, 80 youth kids that I just mentioned about how can we get them into our junior high with coach gray and, you know, coach gray, how can we get those 
you know, up to the high school and really making sure that um, the whole pipeline is, um, you know, working so that these guys are, are coming through the whole system and kind of coming through what we all want. We're all on the same page as far as coaches. We've, we've met and we're all alumni, you know, Mark Orth, who, who runs our youth was on my team. And then Garrett Gray was just shortly after me. And, you know, Garrett and I were in, in Tiffin together for a few years when he was at Tiffin and I was at Heidelberg. And so, you know, just how can we continue to make the experience when someone enters our program as a third grader or a fourth grader, how can we make that experience memorable and fun and um, an experience that they want to be a part of next year and the following year and the year to come? Um, and that way, yeah, by the time they get to their ninth ninth grade year, they're, they're ready to go. They have a, a strong foundation of wrestling and, you know, we're not teaching, you know, basics on, on, on day one or going over the rules. Um, obviously we'll, we'll have that group still, but, um, you know, having more guys ready to go that freshman year. And I think we've got to focus on the, on the pipeline and, and continuing to strengthen that. So, and, and it's been a, they've been doing a great job down there. So. The pipeline, I think is the biggest thing. When I look at it, I talked to this guy, uh, Andrew Wolf. He wrestled for coach Goldman in Indiana. He was a uh, coach at Kent state. Now he's at Maple Heights. Um, my son, Ferd wrestled his son, uh, last year at Aurora. Anyhow, he's an Aurora guy now, but you know, he coaches and teaches at, uh, Maple. Anyhow, he gave me one of the greatest quotes ever. He said it to me the other night. I went, I was doing the Cleveland state pit match, walked up to me. He's wearing a Ohio shirt. I was all fired up. Anyhow, he goes, you can't make kid, your kids love this. He's like, but you can absolutely make them hate it. And I was like, dude, boom, you just nailed it. You yeah. just nailed it. It's like Haywald, going back to what Haywald said. Make it fun. Make it game. Dude, this isn't rocket science. No, yeah, it's it's not. Listen, my brother Tate is not a rocket scientist. He was a state champion. He had he could attack both sides of the body. He had to stand up off bottom. This meeting is being recorded. And I don't know what just happened. Anyhow, <laughs> he – uh. He had a stand up, Tate had a stand up off bottom, he had a, like, attack both sides of the body, and he had an arm bar on top. That's it. That's all he needed. Yeah. That's all he needed to guys stay champion. If you can learn, stay in a stance, get in really good shape, attack both sides of the body, get off yeah. the bottom and have some type of hold on top, you can win. You can yeah. win in the state of Ohio. It's, it's yeah. just, it's set up that way. I don't know what else to tell you. Yeah. yeah. You can I win agree. that way. Yeah, I, I mean, even make it more simple. I think if you can get out on bottom and take someone down, you're gonna win a lot. Yeah, of yeah, you don't even. Yeah, no, you don't even. In the state of no. Ohio, you don't even need a top. Yes, exactly. No, yes. in PA. Yeah, in PA, you got us you on top a little bit. Yeah, and I just don't know if people. Yeah, I mean, and it just helps with so much. Here's the wildest thing. Here's more how close all this is. Ready? The guy, the running, the tailback for uh, Perrysburg. I believe his dad was a uh, either a placer or a qualifier, Wallenzak. Yeah, Wallenzak. Wallenzak, Red Wallenzak wrestled at Clay. Yeah. Was he a placer? I'm not sure about that, but I, I just saw him uh, at the Fall Sports Awards about uh, an hour ago. So you know, I think that's his kid. That's at Perrysburg. That's a killer. Um. Yeah. Maybe there's. Yeah. We have. A, we have some Walmsacks here. Yeah, yeah. So we have. Yeah. And there's Walmsack at Perrysburg. I don't. I don't know how it that all, guy, uh, the running back for Perrysburg's Walmsack. He's a Clay Wallingsack. Yeah. yeah. Now I think he originally committed to play baseball at Purdue, and then decommitted and is going to go play football at Toledo. Toledo. Yeah. yeah. Right. So right. I mean, just think about that. That. But that all that base. A lot of that comes from I, that kid doesn't even wrestle now. That dude's like probably going to be like a pro athlete in something, I'm guessing. At some point or another, that guy will play pro football or pro uh, baseball is my guess, whether it's in the minor leagues or he's a practice player in the NFL. But the point is, like, his dad was an athlete. His dad was a wrestler. Yeah. The family's wrestling people, right? Like, you think about that. I, dude, I think that I think Red is his dad. That's crazy if Red's his dad because I think Red was uh, – was he a placer or a qualifier for uh, Clay? Probably on your wall. I can't remember. I should know that, but I can't. I can't remember. No, that's, I that's listen. I'm not here to gotcha moment yet. Yeah. I'm, I'm saying like, but it just like kind of shows you like, look at Connor Smith. Yeah, Connor yeah. Smith 
Wall and Zach and Connor Smith are both up for Mr. Ohio. They're they're like yep. semi finalists for it. Yeah. Right. Connor Smith, obviously, his is he's a he, he's wrestling. He's a state champ, undefeated mm-hmm. last year. He's really good. No, wait, he lost a match last year. Who did he lose to? Scavuzzo. He lost a match to Scavuzzo last year, who was like third in D one. But anyhow, long story short, Connor Smith's really good. But what's what makes him so good? Wrestling. Wrestling is what makes him so good. Yeah. You know, Walling's Zach's just an athlete, but his dad's he comes from wrestling people. I like yeah. to claim wrestling people whenever I can. Trust me. And I think Connor Smith actually spent some time out here in Oregon, lived in Oregon. For, I, I'm not sure, but isn't that yeah, wild? That's why he is. Connor Smith is a heck of a wrestler. I think he lifts yeah. weights too. So he gets after that. He lifts weights. Yeah, he's strong. They yeah. don't hide either. Gibsonburg does a nice job. They don't hide. They go to. <laughs> Maumee Bay, they go to Perrysburg, they go to a bunch of these tournaments and they don't avoid, they don't avoid Perrysburg, they don't avoid all the D1 competition that comes, they don't avoid St. Ed's, they don't avoid. No, there's no, no, hold on, hold on. Did I say they go to the Iron Man? I didn't say that, right? Mm-hmm. Iron Man's a different beast. I'd like to see that kid at the Iron Man, but you better pack your lunch and you better be ready to go and you better not have gone very deep into the uh, football playoffs if you plan on going to the Iron Man because you need yeah. a whole month training cycle six week preferably to do to get to peak for iron man yeah i'm sure you agree with that statement no oh, yeah i i agree with you 100 percent. no gibsonburg does a does a really nice job um with their program and you brought up the the mommy bay classic you get a you gotta come out this year and get some interviews or it depends what you guys got and if there's like uh uh as long as i can film and post highlights or something because i did it a couple years ago but i couldn't post the matches because um, whoever the whatever your guys' agreement was with uh, flow or track or whoever it was at the time, so I couldn't. I did post the one where the guy Troy Fowler was officiating it, and then it was that they were stressing the shin. They weren't calling like the shoelace takedowns. Yeah. They weren't calling that control. And this guy from Brighton took down the Louisville guy. And he had him, and he and he elevated him, and the guy was on his hands, clearly too. The refs yeah. doing it too, but they were being stressed. Somebody in the officiating ranks, wherever it was, was telling him that wasn't too. I was uh, getting screamed at by a, uh, was it Izzy Martinez? Izzy screaming at me. All these guys from out of stage are screaming at me at the yeah. Iron Man. Yeah, and I'm like, listen, I'm not on the officiating crews here. Just relax. I'm a media guy. I'm an yeah. internet loudmouth. Don't yell at me. I'm just an internet guy. I know it's two. You know it's two. These yeah. guys are, and then we're are as, as a result, kind of sucks because I think we've got good officials. Um, it was like for like it took them like a whole like because then COVID happened, a couple things happened. Yeah, COVID happened. That's what yeah. And then so it took them a whole nother cycle to the Iron Man for them to even gain their credibility back. Dang. I mean, they were a joke for a year and a half in, in the United States because they weren't calling the shoelace takedown, the mid shin, yeah. and then yeah. it was wild. But yes, that was my last experience. And then uh, Evans, Jake Evans pinned my nephew and uh, Wyatt in the finals of the uh, Mommy Bay too. So, <laughs> so I, I, you know, I, I got my, I'm, there's memories from that uh, particular. But Brighton had a good team. Brighton beat Perry's first. Yeah, they usually have that. Yeah. Are they coming back? Yeah, they're coming back. Yeah, I like Brighton. I like their style. They wrestle hard, too. So, um, ultimately, where do you guys – where do you see the program? 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Obviously, you're a long-haul guy. This is where you're from. You're, you know, it was a big, huge round trip. It sounds like it was Whitewater, Wisconsin, Heidelberg. Memphis, Tennessee, yeah. Oregon, Toledo, Oregon, right? Yeah. Where do you see it? Yeah, I, you know, I just, um, what I want in, in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years is for, again, like this is, I, I didn't, you know, I, I was part of what Troy and Mark and Mr. Anthony and Ralph Carberly all built. Um, but in 10 years, just similar to the way Ralph, elevated it um from where we were after you know i left and we had some good times when i was there and we were a strong program you know then ralph elevated i want you know this program to elevate with you know more student athletes going out and wrestling in college 
um, when they're done here and um, going on and being uh, college graduates and, you know, all that great stuff, right? Being productive citizens and then obviously the success of the, of the program and, and competitive within the state, um, you know, saying in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, we, we want a state title as a team. Yes, of course, we want those things, but um, we really want, um, you know, looking, you know, looking ahead, you know, we want the program to be, you know, when I leave or when my time comes and the next guy steps up, that it's it's just what it has been the last 10, 10 15 years, a well-oiled machine, and the next guy can come up and kind of take this thing and, and continue to, to progress it forward. So that's the way I see it, just, you know, continuing to manage and, and, and make adjustments to what's already been put in place and then, um, you know, setting it up for five, 10 years down the road. And then eventually my time will come to an end. Right. And, you know, so when the next guy comes in, they can just take it and run and, and things are in place like they kind of already are now. So that's a big goal of mine. I always say, you know, uh, Marty Knopfel, and I'm sure you know, Marty Knopfel, he, when I, when I got hired, he said, coach, just don't screw it up. And so <laughs> that's one of the things, you know, I was thinking like, don't screw this up, continue to do right by the kids, do right by the program and, and try to, try to elevate it so what's wild to me about like northwest ohio too is uh blue collar people not just like educators who do a lot of the coaching you got a lot of people who are tradesmen you got people who own their own businesses who mm -hmm. give a lot back to the sport of wrestling and i think that's what i like to see about like i would say oregon ohio i would say it's blue collar that's just me yeah, and, and my experience growing up there and you know obviously all my uncles and uh, you know, my parents, my grandparents, uh, being from there and like, you know, uh, all my cousins, they're in the trades. You know, my cousin Buck is a, is a master carpenter. Jake's an iron worker. Uh, cousin Don, he's a contractor as well. He can do master carpentry as well. I mean, they're, they can build anything. They're, they're, oh man, my uncle Dan was on, you know, you remember my uncle Dan Miller? I think so. Yeah. I, th I, I remember your brother for a little bit more. I'm uh, sorry. Sorry about that. He's man, he's a grumpy guy. He's a grumpy guy. Uh, I'm not sorry about that. Hey, yeah. So everyone's always like, man, you're always, you're always hard on your brother. And I'm like, well, first off, my brother's hard on me. He calls and screams at me periodically. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, and then they're like, well, why'd you name your kid after him? I get that one a lot. I'm like, it was my grandfather. It was my, my grandfather. My, my brother's named also after my grandfather. Yeah. And then there was another, you know, my grandfather's father was also Ferdinand Joseph. So it's fourth out of five generations. My son is the fourth out of five generation Ferdinand Joseph. I love my brother. Don't get me wrong. Um, I mean, my brother Ferd forgets more about wrestling in a day than I know. You know, he's Ian's dad. He's the reason that, you know, he really f figured out a way to develop Ian. And obviously Ian yeah. is one of the best guys ever out of your area. Yeah. You know, Ferd um, would, uh, you know, your brother ran middle school workouts for. Ferd, dude, Ferd knows the sport of wrestling. My brother, Ferd, and, he, he, yeah, he knows it. Yeah, yeah, he did a great job. And uh, Keith Whitstead and Connor Whitstead invited a bunch of us out from Oregon. And we went out for, I don't know, two months. We'd go out to you guys. And he, your, yeah, your brother ran. And those were some, you know, Kirk Tank, um, Keith Witt, Connor Witt, Ian Miller, um, some of us Oregon kids. Uh, you, and, uh, you guys, it was an intense workout. And, yeah, your brother was intense. And he struck fear in me many times. So, yeah, so he is um, – he obviously just understands it a lot. He understands, like yeah. – um, the biggest thing that I think my brother Ferd I noticed was um, he understands the hand fighting of it. He understands yeah. the head position of everything. And like, if you can move your feet, move your hands and always have someone like, it feels yeah. like a brick in a dryer. A lot of it. Like if, if like, I mean, I can't imagine wrestling Ian right now. Ian would steal. He would, he would literally like, I think he could kill me. Like in the yeah. strictest sense of like, Predator snapping my spine, like you could probably kill me. And he weighs 165 pounds, or Wyatt, or who I mean, it's just like yeah. the level is just dude, how they move and they pull you mm -hmm. and, they, and their head position. And I'm like a 43 year old dude with a dad bod, you know what I mean? I don't, I mean, I used to be able to do that, even you know, then last like uh, last time I tore my ACL, like 2013, 
my wife's like, yeah, don't, don't wrestle anymore. And I wrestled a little bit last year and she's like, please don't wrestle anymore. <laughs> and she's right. Because I like picking my kids up and playing with them and hiking and doing like dad yeah. stuff with them. So like, what do I really need to wrestle for anymore? Um, somebody was like, Hey, try jujitsu. But I heard in jujitsu, it's like real methodical and slow, but you can like yeah. somebody could break your arm or snap your neck. Yeah. So I'm not into yeah. that either. I'm all set on that. But my brother Ferd knows the sport of wrestling. And to the point, you guys have so many tradesmen over there. You have so many people yeah. who are in the pipe fitters. My uncles were pipe fitters, boiler makers. Uh, your best friend's dad was a millwright, worked at Jeep for 75 years or whatever. Dude, my papa Ferd, my son Ferd and I watched him. He was sick yesterday and we stayed home. And I had this video of my papa Ferd were on his front porch in, on Grissel Road. And I did like the first like thing I ever did with um it was like my first year doing flow wrestling and I had this camera. And we just sat on his porch. He talked about World War II. He talked about being raised on Willard Street in East Toledo. And he just talked about his kids. He talked about he was one of ten kids, nine sisters and him. His dad died when he was two. And it's just like, that's the essence of Northwest Ohio to me. The tradesman, the working man, you know, because it's like little Detroit. It's the glass city. And I just like the blue collar grit of all of it. I like, that's what I like about when I come over there. Because it's like, I don't think people realize that I was raised by like a, a guy who was a tradesman. I, they don't realize a journeyman mm -hmm. iron worker raised me who was raised by a journeyman iron worker. And then all my uncles were pipe fitters. But you do know this. My dad does have a brother who's a doctor. Did no, you, I didn't know that. No. Yeah, my uh, uncle Kenny, my uncle Kenny, was raised with three pipe fitters and an iron worker, by an iron worker, and he became a doctor. And then my aunt Sherry is retired from the city of Oregon uh, last year, so she's an angel, man. My kids love her. But like, the essence of the working man and the blue collar—that's what Clay is to me. Yeah. And then all my dad's friends were always—he's an iron worker. He's a pipe fitter. He's a carpenter. He's a millwright. He's a mason. That and um, I'm actually teaching that now. It's actually okay. literally the unit I'm on right now. Like tomorrow in my class, we're gonna go to the U.S. Uh, Bureau of Labor and Statistics, and we're gonna look at all the trades. And I will tell the kids the reason I am here as your teacher is because if I had to do one of these trades, I uh, my family would have started. <laughs> <laughs> he helped me build this deck out back. In yeah. my backyard, this massive deck. It's all everything's got a story with my parents. And yeah. um, there was a mill, like a big piece of mill machinery, a lathe that they needed that they ordered special for the Jeep plant uh, in yeah. Toledo. Yeah. And this it's dude, it's right over here. It's like right over my shoulder and uh, right <laughs> out my studio door and out this glass sliders. He brought the frames from the box, they shipped it from either Japan or China. Mm -hmm. on an ocean freighter yeah and that is what the frame of my wooden deck is made out of it's made out of everything's all re it's all repurposed junk and then um my shed over here they built it in woodmore shop and then he brought the other side of that box and that's the platform it sits on and uh, he was helping me i was drilling uh the uh treated walmanized lumber onto it I was sinking and I missed and I stabbed myself in the finger and oh, yeah and I was like and he's like y'all right we need to go to the hospital and I was like no but you were right all those years ago I'm horrible at this and my family would have starved if I'd have done this for a living and he just like my dad just like looked at me and he laughed and my third kid was a baby and he was like holding him I was yeah. like you were right though I would have starved so at least you know it's all right to be honest with yourself. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure is. You didn't have to go to the Teflon mill, did you? No, no, never did. Just uh, I went a few times and, and you know, picked my, you know, if it was visiting dad or something like that. But um, no, no, like I said, I I knew pretty uh, pretty early on I wanted to get involved in coaching, and so how can I how can I coach? What's the easiest way I can coach? And, and it was it was through education, through teaching. So. Dude, you literally sound like Ned Shuck at times. You must have spent <laughs> a lot of time with Ned Shuck in the office. Yeah, I spent, well, we spent yeah, we spent a lot of time together in the office. And you know, we talk. Uh we probably what a talk. great guy. What a just good freaking dude. Hey.
besides Kenny Monday, the only two-time guest on the Barbarian Hour, Ned Shuck, just so you know. Yeah, he'll yeah he'll do yeah he'll do your show and ever. So he's awesome. no, he's That's great. he's a good dude and he's a worker, man. I tell you what, he is a worker, and I'm excited to see what he's gonna do with Bellerman. We have one of our wrestlers here committed to him, Micah Medina. Oh, is um, that where Medina's going? Yeah, he's going to Bellerman. He's a senior this year for you guys, right? Yep, he's a senior, probably be, yeah. you know, 120, 126. So um, he's going to go wrestle for Ned. And, um, yeah, man, Ned's a worker, and he's going to get that thing going down there. I'm excited for it. They're in that transition period. Yeah. Which is, in my opinion, and I'll say it, it's the dumbest thing ever. Cal Baptist just finished theirs up um, out in Riverside, California. Augustana, South Dakota, I want to say, is in the middle yeah. of that. It's just, yeah. it's just Gardner Webb was in it when I was in college. This, I'm whatever, not a fan. Don't yeah, think it has a place anymore. Sorry, it's stupid. Yeah. The, the four years, no tournament time when transitioning up a division. Sorry, don't agree with it. But hey, that's for another time. Do you have anything else for me so I can let you get out of your classroom, you maniac, on a Thursday night? No, I uh, no, I just appreciate um, you having me on and talking Oregon and talking clay wrestling, and uh, that, it's it's definitely a passion of mine, and I'm I'm excited to get this season rolling and uh, hopefully see you around at some tournaments and. Uh, we won't be at the Ironman, but we'll be at Brexville. We'll be at, obviously, our tournament. Uh, we'll be out at Solon, at the Solon tournament to start the year. So my uh, wife teaches at Solon. Uh, our last, yeah, we'll be out there for the Comet Classic. That's a, that's usually a good tournament to start the year. Um, and then I think our last tournament out your way will be out at Berkshire um, out in February. So You're, you're in Burton? Berkshire. Burton. It's Burton, Berkshire. Oh, yeah, Burton, yeah, Berkshire High School. Berkshire, yeah. it's Geauga County. Yeah. What are you so, doing over there? Yeah, it's um, it's because we have a little off time after the Maumee Bay Classic as far as a tournament goes. Um, and so we kind of want to get our guys one more tournament feel before we head into the postseason. You and are going some... to be at the top of Geauga County, my friend. Yeah, I was actually uh, yeah, trying to find uh, – an affordable, decent hotel that's nearby there has been kind of tough. What'd you go to Manor? So you gotta go to like Manor. We're gonna actually stay, probably stay in Solon at the same hotel we're staying at for the Comet Class. You're gonna drive 45 minutes, dude. I said 20 minutes on Google Maps. Yeah, 20. Yeah. Talk to me about Geauga <laughs> County in February. All right. Well, uh, we'll see how that goes for you. Yeah, well, I'll take your advice. I haven't booked anything yet, and so I'll, I'll don't try book to find anything. Something. Go go in Manor or go in. Uh, Matters up on the lake, but it'll be like the same type of uh, because you just go right down 44 or Chardon if Chardon's got a hotel or Concord Township, where it's actually in this, it's actually in the school district where I teach, which isn't that far from uh, Berkshire, it's right by the career center where yeah. all the uh, where the kids go, um, from Berkshire actually go, so you know it can't be that far away. But um, well, dude, thanks for coming on, I appreciate you, Coach Warren. Good luck this year, we will cross yeah, paths, I promise. Yeah, you gotta get Coach Troy on here too. We gotta get Coach Troy. We already so. listen. It's already a done deal. He can only avoid me for so long. I, they don't make him better than that guy. He's awesome. Go Eagles. Go Eagles. Go Eagles. Uh, I always gotta give a shout out to the Screaming Eagles in 1966, the last GLL champions in school history. I want to say. Yeah, 66. Because then we didn't win a league title again until my senior year. Yeah, because. Bedford was in the league and Bedford yeah. won it like 27 years in a row or some inordinate amount. Yeah, it was crazy. Uncle, was, Dan, no. Uncle Dan, shout out to Uncle Dan. Rest rest in peace. Uncle Dan um, was a GLL champ that year. They had the Harris brothers. One of them was killed in Vietnam, Irv Harris. The Harrises were tougher than a $2 steak. They had really good guys. My dad had really good guys on his team. And um, my dad tells stupid stories about he's Got all the records at Clay. Got pinned the fastest and whatever yeah. other stupid dad jokes he has. Coach Wharton, thank you for coming on the Barbarian Hour. Go out and check everything out at barbarianapparel.com for singlets, 
whatever you need, whatever gear you need. I got my hoodie on. Coach Wharton, stick around. Thank you for the time. Yeah, thank you.